Summer's here. Strap in. <laughs> Hi, this is Erin, and welcome to Everything EFL, my little podcast about English language teaching and other teachy stuff too. Credit and honourable mentions will be given during the episode or in the show notes. Let's crack on. Hello, you gorgeous teacher. So lovely to have you here. If you're new, you are most welcome. If you're a regular listener, welcome back. Delighted to have you. So, what are we talking about this week? Summer. The one word that is guaranteed to strike fear into the heart of any teacher or academic team. While teachers in kind of normal state schools are on their holidays, this is the time of year when it really ramps up for us. It's complete and utter chaos and bedlam for about six weeks. Even with the best will in the world, the best we can hope for is organised chaos. We've all experienced the full range of the capabilities of those in charge. There's nothing like summer to really show what the academic team is made of. I've been in charge myself. Summer, it's a nightmare from an admin point of view. I have full sympathy for those in charge. My only advice would be organise early, recruit early. If you get a handle on those two things, you just might stand a chance of getting through to September without losing your mind. Summer schools, they are a special animal, aren't they? They definitely strike fear and dread into the heart of any seasoned teachers. So little warning here, guys, the following may trigger a mild form of PTSD in some teachers. A lot of CELTA graduates start their teaching career in like a six-week summer school type environment. These summer schools are run by... I don't know who, for a massive profit in a six to eight week window. And it really is a different kind of hell from a year round language school. Have you ever worked in one? I'm being generous when I say they're pretty chaotic. They're usually understaffed, disorganised. A lot of new teachers start there for some experience. Talk about out of the frying pan and into the fire. Let me set the scene. Students come in and out of this school like cattle in some cases. Um, They're short-termers, there are a lot of teenagers. If you live in an English-speaking city, you've probably seen groups of these with matching backpacks snaking their way through the city centre, usually with a, a poor group leader who's barely older than them. I mean, they seem to be having a great time. We'll get back to those students in a bit. First, I feel compelled to share my first EFL job experience, which was in a summer school um, just south of London. So the teachers arrived, but it was hours before we were given something to eat, before we could move into our lodgings. It was very clear very quickly that the organisation wasn't really there and the wrong person was put in charge. One teacher abdicated on the first night and the director of studies did a runner on the second night. A group of Turkish students, actually a busload of Turkish students, turned up late one night with no warning from the sales office. The activity leader didn't think that printed lists of students were necessary for day tours off campus to another location. That's the kind of place it was. I've got lots of fond memories too. The camaraderie of the teachers being the best one. It was an absolute scream because just of the whole, just the complete nonsensical organisation and there was nothing else you could do but laugh. I could go on, but that's not why you're here, is it? Before I get into the activities the title of this episode promises you, I would just like to talk about those students briefly. So they're flying over to whatever country for a couple of weeks. They're here for a good time. They're going to have loads of activities organised or the sites. Pretty much every minute of their day has been scheduled into some kind of timetable. Learning English may be down on the list of priorities. Now, as a dedicated teacher, that is hard to hear, but it is the truth. So bearing that in mind, here's just a little bit of advice for you. These kids have been at school all year round. By the same token, if you're teaching adults on a short term course in a year round school, they've been working all year round. Now, these two very different groups of people do have one thing in common. They probably don't have a lot of headspace, which leads me to I wouldn't plan too many grammar lessons unless requested. Remember, the kids do this at school. The adults have done it at some point. But there are so many other really cool things you can focus on, such as building their confidence, 
with games, competitions, fun projects and collaborations, community building activities, songs. Why don't you open up their world to show how varied and engaging learning English can be? Do activities where students are assigned roles, swap them out so everyone gets a chance to lead, if they want though, that's also very important. Find out what they like and do some interesting lessons based on that. More work, you say? Well, maybe, but your students will look forward to your class, even though they have this like super packed schedule. Get them to vote on the songs and the projects and the presentations. Get them to teach you something. Check out episode 56 with Wanda Atkins for a bit of inspiration there. You then can furnish them with functional language and the communication skills they need to complete these tasks and also life skills. My last bit of advice would be, again, sort of skirting around or kind of avoiding explicit grammar lessons is go lexical. You know, teach them phrases and expressions that can be put into fun dialogues and performances. So the key phrases here, guys, are enjoyment and engagement. Anyway, without further ado, I've got five easy activities to do with your summer classes. I've provided one or two links in the show notes as examples. Can I just please start with a disclaimer? There's nothing amazingly innovative here, okay? Um, I'm just taking into account that your busyness and, you know, you've got new groups coming in all the time and perhaps you're not a very experienced teacher and you have to throw together quite a lot of lessons in a short amount of time. So these kinds of things are here to help you. These are kind of one size fits all, but of course, you know, use your skills to adapt it to your class's needs, abilities, skills and willingness. Okay, number one, treasure hunt or scavenger hunt. You can tailor it to the campus or the grounds that you are on. Look online. There are tons of examples of treasure hunts and scavenger hunts. You could do like a a classic A to Z, give the students time to find something beginning with each letter of the alphabet. You could modernise it. They could take a picture of things that you want them to find. You could create little four-line poems as clues and get them going to different locations, ending up with, I don't know, a little prize at the end for which group gets there first, something like that. You could give them a list of tasks to do. You could get them to film each other. Like, for example, if you have a, a playground on or near your campus, you could get them to film each other sliding down the slide or to create like a 20 second dramatic scene, like there's an earthquake or something like that. They have to put a little bit of dialogue in there. And then students could upload these onto a Padlet or Flipgrid. So, like I said, there are tons of variations online. Have a look, see what you can find and just have a go. See what you think. Number two photo story. First, get students to design a storyboard with them as the main characters. Give them, I don't know, six or eight frames to tell the story. They can write the speech bubbles and the dialogue and then tell them they're going to take pictures of each other acting out the scenes on the storyboard. They can use the campus or the surrounding area as scenery or locations. If you do this over a week as a a long project, students can organise costumes and props and stuff like that as well. So sort of the more you dedicate to it, the more creative um, the students can be with it. If students don't really have much inspiration, maybe they could recreate the scene from a film or something like that. Give them time, though, when they are actually taking the pictures to set up the scene and take photos. And then you've got a couple of options. You could go old school and you could print the pictures and the students can stick them onto like sugar paper. They could cut out speech bubbles and write it and write the dialogue themselves or A more modern solution would be to find an app. Students can upload the pictures and then they create their speech bubbles. On the show notes, you'll find a link to one such app. You're welcome. So number three, staying with the video theme, video project. Come up with ideas and vote. Okay, so again, see what the students want to do. You can help them with a few options, but ultimately the choice is down to the students. It could be a guide to something. So lots of phrases could be taught. So, for example, a guide to Dublin, in my case, Um, they could choose an aspect of the place they're in and do a little video about the history of it or the tourist spots or something like that. Or maybe how to a how to video furnish your students with the language they need. Okay, the good thing about this, guys, is the language comes from the students. It's emergent language. So you are basically correcting the language that emerges from them. You're teaching them what they need for this project. 
Keep a note of some of this language, though, because the, you have more language then to play with after the project is finished. You can recycle and reuse some of the language with gap fills, questions, correct these sentences, those kinds of activities. Number four, I had to put this one in here, desert. Island. It's an oldie, but a goodie. And there are so many versions of this online. It's low to no prep and it can last a whole lesson. This is great for an emergency lesson. You can just pull it out of your bag or make a, a couple of photocopies and you are good to go. So the premise is you are on a desert island or you're on a boat or you are among the last people on earth or something like that. And you have to, in a group, decide who stays and who goes or which items you have are the most important for your survival. So there's a lot of critical thinking going on there. You've got rationalizing, ranking, explaining opinions and stuff like that. So go online, find a version you like and go for it. Number five, this is something I kind of invented years and years ago vocab collection. Now, can I just say that I, one, I would normally advise against teaching individual words, but if you do this at the beginning of the week, you can use the vocabulary collected from this activity. Um, you could turn these individual words into phrases, insert them into dialogues, and basically give them a wider learning context. And number two, I would usually say never teach with no context, but you never know when words come in handy. When I lived in Germany, I had previously randomly learned the word ants and pliers. And both of these words appeared in my world in Germany. I can't remember the context, but they did appear and I, I understood them. I recognised them. So you just never know when random words will come in handy. We'll get back to that later. So if you have a space to walk around like a, a campus or a school grounds or something like that, you tell these students to bring their notebook and their pen or pencil and they look around them. And if they see an object or a part of an object that they don't know the English for, for example, a license plate on a car or the branch of a tree, they have to draw it and then you can furnish them or elicit from somebody else in the class what the word is. They write it down. Wait till you've probably collected maybe about 20 words, something like that. Then you go back to the classroom and then you make sure there are enough boards or flip chart paper or something like that on the wall, enough for everyone to draw the pictures of the things that they have found. And then you make sure that the students label it as well. Check the spelling, do some pronunciation, and then you make a list on the main board. OK, and your list has two columns, man-made or natural, so students are categorizing the vocabulary. Then you get the students to create vocabulary cards by drawing the picture and labeling it. And then this enables you throughout the week to play memory games, vocab games, board races, uh, which group can make a sentence or find the right verb that goes with this noun. They could rank the vocabulary from the most to the least useful. You can do vocabulary dump. You can use them in phrases and dialogues. At the very least, students have learned a ton of new words, but then work with these words. What can you do with them? Can you turn them into a useful collocation or a phrase or look at another meaning? So think about my last example, the branch. How else could you use that? talk about branches of shops or to branch out, whatever you think the students will respond to or need, you could get them to do the research as well. There's a lot you can do with individual words. I would probably only use this as a summer school activity. I wouldn't use it year round because, like I said, I'm not really about teaching individual words, but it just gives you something extra to do. And then those vocabulary cards will always give you something. If you've got 10 minutes left at the end of the lesson, you can pull out the vocabulary cards and play a game with them. Now, I'm going to throw one in as a bonus. Design your own superhero. This was one of the first activities I was gifted by a more experienced teacher in summer school. So I'm going to gift it to you. So your introduction or your lead in would be, let's say, take Superman or a superhero that they would all be familiar with. OK. So you've got the concept of that and then you elicit certain information about the superhero. What is their alter ego? Where do they work? Where do they live? What's their superpower? What do they typically wear? Do they have a cape? Do they have a sidekick or an ally? Do they have an arch enemy or nemesis? And then you get students to design their own superhero and label it. Now, some students are not great on this, but you could maybe give them some time on their phones or online to research, for example, fan art of superheroes or something for inspiration. 
tell them don't be afraid to steal things from different superheroes to make your own. You could put them in pairs if they're struggling, but then you could furnish them with language to describe and present this superhero. Marvel and the other one, whatever it is, are huge right now. Um, so superheroes is a pretty good context. But I mean, you know, if they're not responding to superheroes or you find out they're not really into superheroes, is there some other kind of context where you've got a great example of a character and then students can invent their own? So that's it. My well is dry. What's your go-to summer activity that you reuse? I'd love to know. If you enjoyed this episode, I would really appreciate a review on Spotify or Apple. I would really appreciate you talking me up to another teacher, maybe sharing a link to this or any other episode. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. You can also follow me on Instagram, Facebook. I'm also on LinkedIn under Erin O'Byrne. You can send me an email with requests, comments, whatever you like. My email's in the show notes. But most importantly, guys, be kind to yourself and share the love. Bye. <laughs>